Ronald McNair, the first black American man in space, could be of Cameroonian ancestry. Sadly, he died together with six of his colleagues in the space shuttle that crashed in January 1986. His brother, Carl McNair, lives in Atlanta, Georgia, with his family. When he started to write a book about Ronald McNair, he felt the need to trace his ancestral roots deeper. He then did a DNA test. The result of that test indicated that his ancestors were from Cameroon in Central Africa, precisely from the Mafa tribe. I was overwhelmed and just thinking about it right now gives me goosebumps that I said, I'm from some place in Africa. I know where I come from. I don't I can't I don't have to say I'm from Africa. That's a whole it's a continent and you can be from anywhere. I'm from Cameroon. And a certain uh, a high degree of pride come from being able to say where you're from, where your ancestors are from. After my husband had done his and he was so excited about it, we have several friends who we all talked about it and everybody was excited about doing their own. And I wanted to do mine because he had done his and mine did not come back as Cameroonian and I was disappointed at that time. Um, mine came back as Nigerian, but the tribe that my ancestral lineage is from is the same tribe that my husband in Cameroon is from. So, you know, we kind of teased one another about, you know, slipping across the borders, uh, and we were probably brother and sister somewhere along the line. Today, 13% of Americans are of African origin, and the ancestors of a large proportion of them arrived the Americas as enslaved people during the transatlantic slave trade between 1514 and 1808. The level of interest in knowing their ancestry is quite high among African Americans. We are here at the Savannah State University in Georgia. The student population is predominantly black. Practically every African American to whom we put the question was interested in knowing their connection with Africa. I would love to always know where I came from and trace my roots back to Africa. We live here in America and our society is based off like, you know, a lot of people coming from different nations and we want to know where we come from. And um, by going to see our roots, we can finally answer that question. I do have um, some good information about my roots, but I feel like it's not enough. Um, but I know my family, we do take it really serious. Every time we take, um, we do family reunions often. And every time we do that, we always try to do some kind of history. And we always honor the oldest person in the family because it's such a big deal. And if I had the opportunity to go, you know, back to where my roots are from all cultures and all ethnicities, I would really enjoy that because it's, it's not just one person that makes me me, it's cultural. In school, they only teach us so much about our African culture. And I think it would mean more coming from our ancestors and going back to where we actually came from rather than an interpretation of what somebody wrote and wanted us to know. In order to know where we're going in the future, we have to have a clear understanding of where we came from in the past. Uh, I tried to do some research on my own and uh, I got as far as like 1875 and then records seemed to be lost on my family. So if I could trace my roots back further, I would love to just so I could know who I am. Dr. Emery has spearheaded reconnection with Sierra Leone in West Africa for decades. When he visited the country, he was given a title, Bakori, with the status of a chief. Well, you know, living in America, African Americans were always looked upon as a lesser citizen. Uh, and when other people in this population can say I'm an Irish 
or I'm an Italian or I'm a whatever an Englishman uh, American those hyphenations uh, we we begin to say it about 40 years ago African American before then we were Negro what did that mean nothing or black person didn't mean anything and then we began saying African American but we didn't know why we really couldn't point to any evidence of how African we were at Emory University in Atlanta professor Elt is who has been studying the slave trade for over 40 years is working on a research project called the African Names Project. Mm -hmm. It aims to trace the origins of captured Africans rescued from slave ships by the abolitionists using their names as clues. The abolitionists had these freed people registered in courts around the Atlantic set up to facilitate the abolition drive. Names from Cameroonian ethnic groups feature on those registers. We've already identified about um, a thousand uh, names of people that we know left from um, courts in the Cameroon Republic. And this is for a limited period. It's from 1822, I think, to 1837. I'm not forgetting the article I wrote 10 years ago. Mm -hmm. um, and we were able to identify which part of the Cameroon they came from. Her name is Dr. Felicia Bell. The name Bell, for example, is typical of the Sawa ethnic groups found around the coast of Cameroon, so she could be of Cameroonian ancestry. Some researchers believe that this kind of evidence is more reliable than DNA evidence because the database of African DNA is not yet strong enough. Do you have any idea where the name Magne comes from? Because... <laughs> I have an idea, but I don't know for sure because just outside of where I grew up, there was a, a McNair family. It turns out uh, one of them turned out to be the governor of South Carolina. And since it's only like three miles from where I grew up, I get a feeling, though I have no, no proof, that somehow that we ended that my ancestors were on their farm. <laughs> uh, and yeah. On the basis of DNA evidence, 50 African Americans, or Cameroonian Americans as they are now called, visited Cameroon in December 2010. Carl McNair from Atlanta was among them. They received a warm and unforgettable welcome. That visit was organized by Arc Jammers, a civil society organization on a not-for-profit basis. Arc stands for Acts of Random Kindness. In the original plan, Art Jammers meant to bring together artists for a musical event in Cameroon. That's when the idea of inviting DNA tested Cameroon Americans came up. We sent out invitations to these African Americans saying, look, if you're interested in joining us on a trip to Cameroon, um, please let us know. And within a day, we had received over 50 requests you know, within the next two days, we got over 100. The historical significance of the trip was becoming evident to us as we prepared it. During the visit of the Cameroon Americans, the village of Bimbia became the most important stopover because of its historical significance. It is perhaps Hard to believe it now, but 200 years ago, Bimbia was a vibrant locality inhabited by the Isubu tribe with a powerful ruler called Bile. 
later answering to the name King William. He signed trade agreements with Europeans. The most important commodity at the time which made the Isubu rich was slaves that they obtained through intricate trade channels from the interior of Cameroon. This cannon, for example, served the abolitionists to suppress illegal slave traffic. Most importantly, there are the relics of this former slave port. From the port, some of the slaves were transported to Nicol Island by dock out canoes because they could not escape from the island. When Carl and his group visited Bimbia, they were presented an enactment of the slave trade and the role of the local chiefs in organizing the capture of each other's peoples and selling them into slavery. As a child growing up, we went to places like Jamestown, Virginia, so that we saw where slaves came in, but we never really connected with that. But when I saw this at um, Lindy, it was just very emotional. It was really a bit overwhelming. You can talk about it, but when, they, when we went there and saw it, it uh, impacted me in particular in a way that it would normally would not have you know, we hear about slavery, it's like me talking about what happened in the 60s growing up in South Carolina. These kids don't, they don't, they, they can't, they see the pictures and all that, but they can't relate to that. Just as I would not have been able to relate what my ancestors went through uh, in, during the slave trade. And you know that at one point in time, there were slaves that were there waiting for the ship to come in and to be shipped off for the last time. That, that, was, that was very emotional. Uh, on that same um, location, we had a chance to walk down to the shore. And it's kind of like Cameroon's or uh, port of no return. So for most of them, it was supposed to be a, a, a trip of discovery and a heightened touristic experience. But it turned out to be more than that. It turned out to be a spiritual journey. It turned out to be a, a return home of a kind that none of them had ever envisaged. So it became a very highly emotional uh, uh, enterprise for all of them. A great granddaughter of an Isubu king who sold slaves was in that audience and watched the reenactment with the Americans. I was surprised and I was really touched because of what those people went through because I put I myself you. in their places. I felt really bad, and when the American representative was about to make a, make a speech, when she started crying, I also wept. The ruins of the slave port have remained practically unknown by the present generation, even of the Bimbia indigens. Some rumors hold that it was a taboo locality whose existence remains unacknowledged publicly. As a child, we, you know, most of the information about slave, slave trade is, is passes from 
one person to the other. At that time, we were not particularly interested in slave, the slave port, but we just knew that there was a slave port out on the other end of the village. When I was small, when I was going to Bimbia on holidays, they never took me there. We, I learned it in history that, was, that there was a slave market there. I'm seeing the slave area only now that the Americans came like this. The prominence of the Bimbia slave port rose after the decline of other important slave markets. La configuration de la côte camerounaise, n'est-ce pas, va permettre, va jouer un rôle important parce que les navires pourront se cacher facilement et continuer ces, ces trafics-là. Donc, au plan géographique, le Cameroun sera un centre, une plaque tournante, n'est-ce pas, de ces trafics euh, négriers transatlantiques. Et à partir donc des côtes camerounaises, n'est-ce pas, on va aller vers le Brésil, on va aller vers les Antilles, on va aller vers l'Amérique du Nord. N'est-ce pas? Donc, en passant par euh, le, le, le verrou que va constituer Fernando Po. During the slave trade era, Cameroon as a nation did not exist. But people from the territory that is now Cameroon ended up in slavery through Nichols Island and other islands like Fernando Po and the slave port of Calabar in Nigeria. Dans les 60 ans qui ont suivi l'abolition, le trafic s'est développé considérablement sur les côtes camerounaises parce qu'il y a une facilité de se cacher, une facilité de poursuivre la traite de manière clandestine. Donc, il n'y a pas d'archives. On peut estimer que le Cameroun est allé autour du quart, c'est-à-dire s'il y a eu 12 millions ou 11 millions, le quart de cette population-là vient du Cameroun. What did they know was going to happen to those people? Mm -hmm. I don't know if they knew. Mm -hmm. This monument that speaks of what the slaves endured on their passage across the Atlantic Ocean stands on the riverside of Savannah in Georgia. Savannah, today a cheerful and pleasant city, the birthplace of David Mercer the famous musician and one of the emblematic symbols of the city, there are signs everywhere to make sure that Savannah does not forget the slave trade. Today, massive ships bear thousands of tons up and down River Savannah. In the slave era, ships that arrived here were hardly as big as this one and were packed to breaking point with human beings from Africa reduced to the status of cargo. The journey took about six weeks. Conditions were such that uh, almost you would never find a European migrant, migrant ship with conditions like you have here, even in the worst uh, examples of vessels coming from the Irish famine in the 1840s, um, mortality rates were much lower, um, uh, food uh, conditions generally were just better on the, on the, in the North Atlantic. Um, it's, if your objective is just to get as many people as possible across the Atlantic and not take any account of, of their sensations, um, then this is what you're going to end up with. So you would get uh, three or four hundred slaves on a vessel which was maybe um, uh, 80 foot, 80 feet long. Um, they would be packed um, on the top decks. The greater part of the slave ship was taken up with water barrels because, as you can see from the photograph, dehydration was the problem. Sullivan's Island in Charleston. South Carolina. The dominant structure here is this fort. Fort Moultrie that was a defense base during the American Civil War. One small plaque holds a reminder that it was here that the majority of enslaved peoples landed upon arrival in America. Research tells us that 40% of all people of color 
that were taken away from the coast of West Africa and brought to North American soil first came here to Sullivan's Island. After the arrival, the first stop was the slave market. This is an old slave market, Ryan's Mart in Charleston, today housing a museum about slavery. Prior to 1856, slave auctions in Charleston took place primarily on the waterfront, public spaces. After 1856, they're going to say move it inside, move these auctions inside. And the reason for it is they say it's traffic congestion, uh, not a humanitarian concern, but another reason that they don't say what is certainly there is people are witnessing spectacle. One in five families are broken up on the auction block. Several hundred, uh, well actually several thousand slaves may be sold off in a month's time and people are writing about what they're seeing. And Ryan's Mart is one of 40 inside auction sites dealing with slaves after that law was passed. Right here in the backyard of Ryan's Mart, the captured people were quarantined. And if they did not die after two weeks, then they were declared healthy enough to be sold. This is Magnolia Plantation. A typical plantation would be made of a magnificent master's house and the slave quarters. The slave masters provided the basics for their slaves in terms of clothing and lodging, but the slaves tended gardens that enabled them to sustain their families. Inside the slave cabins, there is evidence of their African origins. Here is the main reason why the slaves were brought here, a purely economic one, to provide labor for the plantations, especially cotton and rice plantations like this one, the tight marsh rice plantations worked by slaves in the 1700s and 1800s. Not only was the work hard, but the conditions were harsh. Here, for example, the slaves were exposed to alligators and mosquitoes. Slave labor made Charleston rich. This could be seen especially in the mansions that plantation owners were able to construct for themselves. There were times when over 80% of the population of Charleston was black when the slave owners, unable to stand the environmental conditions, moved to other places, leaving behind the enslaved people to work their plantations. A lot of people don't realize that the majority of arrivals of peoples in the Americas before 1820 uh, were, were actually African, not European. The ratio is something like four to one. For every European that came across, um, there were four Africans. Uh, you get a very large proportion of females coming across the Atlantic who are African, not European. Um, and I did a rough calculation once which suggested that for every eight females that crossed, seven were African before 1820. And that, of course, is very important um, culturally. For the African Americans, the legacy of slave trade was racial discrimination, later institutionalized in racial segregation and which denied them many human rights and later civil rights. African Americans have come a long way, surmounting many difficulties born of that sad past to achieve great things in different domains in the American society. My experience, I. I advise people to, to study, to learn, to educate themselves about their connections. To take a trip, uh, if you went to Africa and come back to America, you actually have been transformed. Transformed in terms of your psychic, uh, your, your confidence, and who you are. Uh, when I was director here, and trips, field trips would come with school children. Uh, the black school children would hang their head because they 
They thought that we would just be talking about slaves, quote unquote. That period of slavery is a shameful period for them. And then when we begin to tell them their connection to an African continent that has given so much and that, and that has done so much for the world, then they leave with their shoulders straight and their chest pushed out, uh, much, a much more proud person. And so that's, that trip and our knowledge about that connection has meant not only meant more to me, but it is being now spread throughout the country. Africa and Cameroon too need to come to terms with its past to acknowledge the bitter truth about the active role its peoples played in slavery through research and through the proper preservation of historical relics. The first 50 African Americans who came in 2010 were offered land in the seaside town of Kribi. This is one way of maintaining the newfound relationship between the Cameroon African Americans and Cameroon. My response is only one of one thing. We always give praises to God, to Jesus Christ, to whom we follow. It's overwhelming. Um, my family, my great grandfather. This is this is this is gravel from the land that he owned, and he was one of the first landowners in our family. And I wanted to bring a piece of our family from America back here to Cameroon. So I had rocks at my house, and I brought them with me on the plane so I could put them in the soil here so I would be returning us back home. Since 2010, other groups of Cameroon Americans have come to Cameroon on the same mission, under the umbrella of Art Gemmas. As for Carl Machner, he plans to come back to Cameroon to trace that route which links him to the Mafa of North Cameroon. Africa will be whole again. Not in terms of everybody moving back to Africa, no. In terms of all of us finally seeing that God created a race of people that we came to call the Africans. Seeing that as standing side by side, just as tall and as proud and as confident as the other races that God created, because it is together that we create this fantastic universe of diversity and color.